Always appropriate as they are worshiping God in heaven. But the one line in our Father's word where it says, Jesus who died shall be satisfied and heaven and earth shall be one, is directly appropriate to the psalm that we will be reading this morning. And I forgot to ask Brother Hype which version of the scriptures y'all usually read from. I don't know if you're. NIV normally, all right, so you won't mind if I read from the ESV. <laughs> I generally try to accommodate because anything from the King James to the NIV and the NASB and New King James are the ones that I normally read from. So Psalms chapter 2 says, Why do the nations rage? and the peoples plot in vain. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then He will speak to them in His wrath and terrify them in His fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry, and you perish in the way. For His wrath is quickly kindled, and blessed are all who take refuge in Him. And may God add His blessing to the reading of His Word. This psalm is historically set in the context of King David taking Jerusalem, beginning to unify God's people under one king, because there are some at that time who had insisted upon following the descendants of Saul, and there was a civil war taking place. And David took Jerusalem, and the, the heathen nations around the Philistines and the Amorites and the Amalekites, they were rising up against David, who we know that God had anointed to be the king of Israel. He had pulled him from the pasture, the last son of Jesse, who no one had even thought about. And Samuel said, do you not have another son? After he had already looked over Jesse's older sons. And God brought David and he anointed him through the prophet Samuel and he promised him that he would be king of God's people. And he waited a long time for that to come to fulfillment. But David took Jerusalem from the Jebusites and he set up his throne in Jerusalem. And we have the response of the nations surrounding them who did not want to be ruled by anyone other than themselves. They wanted no authority over them. And we ask ourselves as we can basically divide this psalm up into three portions. In the first one, in verses basically one through three, it says, Why are the nations raging and what are they doing? The second section it's basically four through nine, and this is God's response to them. And then it finishes out 10 through 12, and it gives an admonition to us 
and to the people is how we should respond in kind. But just like the nations that surrounded Israel at the time of David, unbelievers are no different today than they were then. He says, why do the nations rage? Why are they thrashing and thronging tumultuously? Why are they in such a tizzy over what God is doing in the earth? This is not a mild displeasure. This is not like finding out that your wife or your husband brought home chocolate ice cream when you really wanted butter pecan. This is not a mild thing. This is not even the usual church disagreement over the thermostat or the color of the carpet. They were raging and gnashing their teeth against God and His anointed. And David, who was a man after God's own heart, who wrote several psalms that were of prophetic intent, though the near context was about David and the Israelites at that time, they pointed to a greater reality. And just in the same manner, why would people be so upset over a king who truly wanted nothing but the best for those around him? And it's not just the kings. It says the kings of the earth set themselves. They set their face like a flint. It's like they cemented their feet in the ground. They were not going to be moved from their sinful and ungodly disposition. But it's also the people, princes and paupers alike, kings and servants, are aligning themselves against God and His anointed. They growl and mutter against this king. It's a general and malignant corruption of mankind that refuses to bow before God Almighty. And we can ask, how does this apply to us today? Well, look around. Are the nations raging? Today, are they setting themselves against God and His anointed? I am here today to just briefly tell you that there is no neutrality. I am nigh on to 48 years old. There are some here that are older. There are some here that are younger. I grew up in a time where many of those around me considered the government to be benevolent. That we could serve God on this hand and not pay attention to what government was doing on this hand. I was always admonished growing up, even when I was one of the peoples who plotted in vain before God found me and saved me. My grandparents do not always, they always told me, do not speak of politics and religion in polite company. Everything in our life revolves around religion and politics. Religion first. Politics basically means how we order our lives around our government, the magistrate. And religion and our theology is how we serve God. And quite to the dismay of those who think that the government should be neutral in these areas. Paul says in Romans chapter 13 that the magistrate is the servant of God. That word servant is the same word that we translate as deacon. The magistrate is to serve God. 
And what does Paul say the magistrate is to do? They are to bear the sword and not in vain, but they are to punish the evil and reward the good. You say, well, how is our nation evil and how are we plotting against God? I am a conservative. I am unashamedly and unabashedly a conservative. And I want to say something that may make many of us, and it would have made me uncomfortable several years ago, but simply because I am a conservative does not mean that I am necessarily a Republican. I listened to Fox News for the first time in several months the other day. They have already conceded the point that transgenderism is a necessary thing within our society. They were speaking of changing genders as though it was something that could be expected and that we should expect. This is a vain plot. We cannot change God's created order. God created them male and female. We read about this Genesis 1 and 2. And if you are unsure about what God really meant when he said that, Jesus states it again in Matthew 19 when he's speaking to the Pharisees about divorce. He says, have you not read where in the beginning God created them male and female? From the beginning. But we plot in vain against God's created order. And if you speak against this, the nations rage. Abortion. The lawful but sinful killing of the unborn. There is one political party that supports this up to and including the time of birth. That party is wrong. How can we be a Christian people and support the murder of the unborn? If Jesus said that a millstone should be hung around the neck of one who offends these little ones. How will we be left unpunished when we willfully and wantonly murder them? Upwards of 70 million by some estimates since 1973. And if you are unsure of how are these people and our government is plotting and raging against God Almighty. There was a vote this week about the Defamation of Marriage Act. Now that is not what it was called. But our representatives in Washington voted to codify same-sex marriage into law and they are advancing that proposition through Congress right now. In the same way that God created them male and female, he created them male and female to be joined in a holy union of man and wife. God defines what marriage is, not our government. God has said unashamedly and unequivocally that marriage is between a man and a woman. There are already states who are advocating polyamory, which is an intimate relationship between multiple partners. And it is not just that. It is our 
system of taxation. There are many injustices within our government that are against God's prescribed measures of righteousness. But it's not just against common sense that they rebel. They are rebelling against Yahweh and His anointed. Now, anointed there is where we get our term Messiah. It is the Old Testament equivalent of Christ. We are rebelling daily against Yahweh and His Christ. We are rebelling against God and His Word. And the people said, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. They want nothing to do with God's law. Now we can be sure that we are not saved by God's law. We are saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves. We are justified by faith. Paul writes to us and he tells us, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But I want you to describe to me a practical, everyday righteousness without mentioning the law of God. Don't refer to it in any way. Please tell me what is good and right without mentioning what God has said is good and right. Paul continues in chapter 13 of the book of Romans when he speaks about how we should love one another. Are you aware of what he references when he does this? He references several of the second half of the Ten Commandments. He said, when you're going to love your neighbor, this is what it looks like. Don't steal. Don't kill. And so on and so forth. If we look at the sin list in 1 Timothy chapter 1, where Paul is writing to Timothy, most, if not all, of that list corresponds directly to the Ten Commandments. Paul and the writers of the New Testament did not abandon God's holy standard, and neither should we. But let me reiterate, Acknowledging that standard is not what saves us. I want to be clear that no one leaves this building saying that I can, you can be saved by adhering to the law. Paul also said that by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But we cannot be like the people that are raging and plotting saying we want to entirely divorce ourselves from what God has said is good. He also told the Israelites when he gave them the law, and Moses recorded this, he said, this is a great and good law, and the peoples around you will look at you and say, what a good and great God you have because of this law that you have been given. But the world doesn't care about a church that doesn't stand upon righteousness. They don't care if we simply proclaim that the job of the church is to feed the poor. We should feed the poor. They don't care if you hand out sweaters to people in the winter. And we should hand out sweaters to people in the winter. There was one writer who said this, Doctrines would be readily believed if they involved in them no precepts. And the church may be tolerated in the world if she will only give up her discipline. The world does not hate a neutered church. The world hates a church 
that lives in Christ. The world hates a church that follows the precepts of God Almighty. And if you believe that the world should love us, Jesus in the Gospel of John said, the world hates me because I testify of it that its deeds are evil. A little bit later on he says, don't be surprised when the world hates you because it hated me first. Now we should not be offensive just to be offensive. We should not be hateful simply to be hateful. Because we should also speak the truth in love. It says, let your speech be seasoned with salt. And we should always know how we should answer to those who are without. Warning people that the way that they are going will lead them straight to hell. Should be done in love. And it's a fine line that we often cross. But simply because the world says you are hateful does not mean that you are hateful. I cannot believe them. When I tell someone that unless you repent, you will likewise perish. That is not hateful. That is done out of love of God and love of my Savior and love for the lost. But the world doesn't care as long as we don't stand upon the truth of God. Because you see, the light has come into the world. And they do not come to the light. They hate the light because their deeds are evil. And all of this raging and plotting and what is God doing? He is sitting down the raging and plotting does not even stir God from his rest it is not that he doesn't have an answer it's not that he's not going to do something because he does and he responds and how does God respond he laughs He laughs at the creature who thinks he is greater than the Creator. The Lord, Yahweh, holds them in derision. The God who inhabits the heavens. And those heavens cannot contain Him. He laughs at their evil machinations. He laughs at the plotting and the scheming. Because you see, we often do focus on what is wrong too much. I could get up here and speak for hours about the evils of society and the evils of this world. And you would leave here most likely heartbroken and depressed feeling forlorn and forsaken. But that is not God's intent in the Scriptures. He wants us to be aware of what is happening. But He never leaves us at the spot or the place of being forsaken and without hope. Because while God is laughing... He says, I will speak to them. Now there is a, a broad movement within what can loosely be called the church today who only knows one verse in the Scriptures. They only know that God is love. And if you say anything that contradicts their notion of what love is, 
you will be called all sorts of names. And while the Scripture is very true in what John writes in 1 John, that God is love, that is not His only characteristic. Because when God says that He is love, and that He loved the world in this way, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should perish, should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you read on down to about John 3, 36. Um, John continues. And he basically says that whoever does not believe in the Son is already condemned. And he will not have eternal life. John 3.36 Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God remains on him. God has a holy disposition set against sin. He does not Take it lightly. He does not take the rebellion against him and his anointed as child's play. The wrath of Almighty God remains upon those who reject the Son. Remains presently upon them. Now to be sure, there is a future Wrath of God that will be poured out upon all ungodliness and wickedness of man. But John here, in the third chapter, just moments after saying that God loved the world, says the wrath of God still abides upon those who reject His Son. And here in Psalm chapter 2, just to be sure that Contrary to some people who think the God of the New Testament is a God of love and the God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath. That is simply why I wanted to point out that it's the same God of both Testaments. The God who loved Abraham is the God who is going to speak in His wrath against the nations and the peoples who reject His word. And he says, I will terrify them in his fury. And why? Because God has a remedy for what is wrong. See, David was a king anointed by God, but David was a type of Christ who would come. Where David failed, his son after him would not fail. The king that is set upon the holy hill speaks in verse 7. He says, I will tell of the decree. He says, I will tell of what has been said is happening. I'm going to tell you what the Father has said to me. He said, you are my son. And John, and probably one of my favorite passages of Scripture, and if you hear me speak more than once, I will say that about probably just about every one I recite because <laughs> they're pretty much all my favorite. <laughs> But John chapter 1, the prologue to John's gospel begins. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he calls the One, the Word, the Logos of God. He said, He is the only begotten Son. Because you see here when 
David wrote, The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. He is not saying that the Christ came into existence on the day that God set him up as king. The Christ, the Messiah, there was a point in history where he took on flesh. The, the Son is eternal. We are monotheistic Trinitarians. We believe in one God eternally existing as three persons. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. In the beginning, from before the beginning. It, it's actually, the Word is, has the prefix RK, which we get Archangel, Chief. Archetype. It, it's, he was there from before the beginning. It says, and he was with God. He says he was face to face with God. He was looking at God face to face intimately. And then John says, and he was with God. The one who was looking at God was God. And then he goes on down about verse 14, I believe it is, in John chapter 1. And he says, And he took on flesh and dwelt among us. So we have the eternal Son taking on flesh and being born. The only begotten of the Father. But here we are talking about the, the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed king ascending to his throne. He was begotten of the Father. And he is speaking of his right to reign and to rule. Because the decree came from the Father who is well pleased with the Son. We read in Matthew 3.17 and Mark 1.11 where the gospel writers record the baptism of Jesus. As when he came up out of the water, there was a voice from heaven that said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And the Holy Spirit descended and lit upon him in the form of a dove. We have Matthew recording in Matthew 17, 5 at the Mount of Transfiguration. This voice spoke again. It said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. It says, listen to him. Jesus says that the Father loves me because I do everything that he has sent me to do. And I lay down my life for the sheep. The Father is well pleased with what the Son has accomplished and what He is going to accomplish. And he says, Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage. See, Satan lied to Jesus when, during the temptation in the wilderness. Satan came to Jesus and he said, Bow down and worship at me and I will give you all these kingdoms as you can see. Jesus resp responded with Scripture and said, you know, you shall worship only the Lord your God and only Him shall you serve. Jesus was tempted to sin by getting something that was good that was already promised Him in a way that He shouldn't get them. The Father had already promised the Son that the nations are going to be yours. He said, ask of me, it is your right as my only begotten, the one with whom I am well pleased. Ask me, and the nations are yours, and the ends of the earth for your possession. Now Christ's kingdom is not yet fully consummated upon this earth, but it is present. While he was Speaking of the gospel, when he's speaking to the Jews, he said, the kingdom of God is now among you. He said, it's in your midst. 
And while Jesus' kingdom is definitely not of this world, it does not come from this world, his kingdom is in this world. He is a king today. Matthew 28, 19 says, After the resurrection, when he was speaking to his disciples, Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, He reigns now and he must reign until he has put every enemy under his feet. And the last enemy to be defeated is death. He says, Oh, death, where is that thing? He's reigning and ruling today. And I want to submit to you that that is why even though we should be concerned with what is happening in the world and in our nation and in our families, we should be concerned without fear because Jesus Christ is our King. He is our Lord and our Master. He is the one we look to for our hope and our salvation. Isaiah 11, 9 says, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. We often forget that when He ascended in after the resurrection, it's recorded in the book of Acts. We often simply think of his ascension as his rising up from the earth. And that is very true. He rose up and he left in the clouds. And the angel says, why are y'all standing here looking around with your mouths open? The same Jesus who you saw depart will return in like manner. But his ascension is not just his Temporal, geophysical lifting up from the earth. He ascended to the right hand of the Father. And he sat down. The Queen of England recently passed away, and her son did what? He ascended to the throne of Great Britain. Jesus Christ ascended his throne and he reigns and rules and all authority on heaven and earth has been given to him. And what should we do? We should be wise. Is there anything that is wiser than submitting to the will of God? It says, be not wise in your own eyes for the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Trust not in your own understanding. There's a lot of things that I would like to do that I think would remedy the situation in our country. More often than not, I would just cause more trouble than I actually fix. But there is one thing that I know that I can do, and that is proclaim the truth of God. We can sow and we can water and we can... Love those around us. And then God says, I will give the increase. Proverbs 20 and 26 says, A wise king sifts out the wicked and brings the threshing will over them. We need to be wise in what we do and how we do it. And the wisdom that we should display is an acknowledgement. That Christ is king. He reigns. And he is the head of the church. Amen. I am not the head of the church. You are not the head of the church. Right. We are but little, small, <laughs> insignificant at times members of his body. Thank God if I'm only a pinky toe. 
because he is the head. And it says, trust in Christ. Be wise and repent. Believe the gospel. Know that this anointed king who sits upon God's holy hill bled and died for our sins. That he bled and died for forgiveness. We must trust him. Kiss the son. Give him homage. Recognize who he is. What he has done. This is the king who bled and died, who rose again, that we may be reconciled to God the Father. And I would say that we are about out of time where I would speak about how the Son's wrath can be kindled. Because Jesus, though He is meek and mild, He's going to judge the world in righteousness. Read what Paul said in Acts 17 on Mars Hill. It says, God has appointed that there is a day where He will judge the world by this man. And He showed this by raising Him from the dead. Now I pray that everyone here today is a believer in Jesus Christ. That your sins have been washed away. That your trust and hope is in Him. But if you are not, there is no better today than today. Today is the day of salvation. If you are not a believer, bend your knee. Submit your heart. Repent and believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you are a believer, take courage that the king has not been dethroned. That though the nations rage, he is still setting upon the holy hill of God. And that he is returning to judge the quick and the dead. As the old song says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Let us not forget that as we go. Let us pray. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we, I thank you for this time that we've had together. I thank you for the truth of your word. And I thank you that you have loved a sinful people enough to send your son that he would shed his blood for the remission of our sins. And Lord, I thank you and I praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.